What are some of the most despicable crimes people commit? Let's find out. Starting with number five, the downside of technology. 22-year-old Tiffany Gray received some pretty serious charges after the gruesome passing of Fasil Tecklemerium, a 53-year-old man from Washington, D.C. Gray, along with her accomplice Audrey Miller, was accused of ending Tecklemerium's life, whom she referred to as her sugar daddy. She then severed his thumb to access his banking and ride-sharing apps. An investigation was started when Tecklemerium hadn't been seen for several days, understandably concerning to those who knew him. Him. When authorities checked his apartment, they found him passed away with various injuries and missing his thumb, which was allegedly used to access his phone to get access to his banking app. Surveillance footage showed Gray and her accomplices entering and leaving Tekel Merriam's apartment multiple times around the period of the crime. Tekel Merriam's SUV, which was usually parked outside his building, was also missing, adding to the concern. Detectives eventually found out that Tekel Merriam had previously reported Gray for stealing his phone and running up charges of 18 hundred dollars on his banking app. His cell phone last pinged near College Park, Maryland, near where Gray lived. Surveillance footage and incriminating shoe print found at the scene also linked Gray and Miller to the crime. Additionally, various electronic devices and household items were reported missing from Teco Merriam's apartment. Audrey Miller was arrested first, followed by Tiffany Gray soon after. Both women were charged with Teco Merriam's passing. Investigators think Gray had a pattern of meeting men online and robbing them in sort of a honey trap type scam. In another incident, Gray was accused of robbing a man with the help of accomplices, tied him up, and forced him to reveal his banking pin codes under threat. Hasil Tacklemerium, originally from Ethiopia, worked as a technician for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. His social media profile showed a family-oriented man with a wife and two children, making his passing all the more tragic. His children left a tribute on Father's Day, expressing their love and hope for his long life. As of this video's release, Gray and Miller are in custody awaiting further trial. We suspect their trial isn't going to go well for them, given the amount of evidence the authorities have. Number four, the roommates. Brandon Carlos Grant, a 36-year-old from Miami, was sentenced for ending his roommate's life. Apparently, they had a dispute over a dollar, which ranks up there as one of the worst reasons to end someone's life. Grant and his unnamed roommate shared an apartment in Miami. Early one morning, around 5 a.m., a heated argument broke out between the two. The dispute escalated when the roommate refused to give Grant a dollar. Apparently, the neighbors actually called the police after hearing the commotion because it got so loud. When officers arrived, they found Grant outside the building. Grant was visibly distressed, struggling to breathe and asking for water. The officers questioned him and confirmed he lived in the apartment. Inside the apartment, the police found Grant's roommate in a grim state. He was on his knees, leaning against a couch. He showed signs of getting hit in the face and was totally unresponsive. The victim was eventually pronounced DOA by Miami Rescue. Grant didn't even bother denying what he did. Once he was at the station, he waived his Miranda rights and confessed to the detectives. He admitted he lost control when his roommate refused to give him the dollar, leading to the struggle, resulting in the tragic outcome. Following his confession, Grant was charged and taken to the Turner Guilford Knight Correctional Center, where he was held without bond. It was never explained why it was that Grant wanted the dollar so badly, or why the victim said no, making the situation all the more tragic. We all have the capacity to agree to disagree, and keeping calm all at the same time. Number 3. Securing Help Margarita Benetti from Brazil was accused of enslaving and mistreating her housekeeper in the U.S. for three decades. And yet, somehow, despite this, she'll never be arrested for it. Living in her family's crumbling mansion in Brazil with two guard dogs, Margarita remains untouchable. She was indicted alongside her ex-husband, Rene Benetti, for their treatment of their housekeeper in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. But while Rene was jailed, Margarita fled to Brazil and sought refuge in her family mansion in Sao Paulo. This once lavish home of one of the country's wealthiest families is now crumbling, with boarded up windows, peeling walls, and no electricity. But for Margarita, it's a safe haven, as Brazil doesn't extradite its citizens for trial in other countries. To prevent curious strangers and tourists from breaking in, Margarita has two guard dogs and even throws buckets and plastic bags filled with excrement out of the window, according to neighbors. For years, Margarita was known only as the reclusive neighbor who rarely left the house. Appearing 
peering out the windows with white lotion, bizarrely smeared across her face. Then, in 2022, neighbor Chico Felitti launched a podcast titled The Woman in the Abandoned House, revealing Margarita's dark past. Chico talked about how he met Margarita, who introduced herself as Mary, and how he discovered the tale of the fugitive next door. Even though everyone knows where Margarita lives, she'll never be arrested and taken to the U.S. to serve her sentence as Brazil doesn't extradite its citizens. Her ex-husband, Rene, was already a U.S. citizen when the investigation began and served six years in prison for his crimes. Chico described how, despite being a known FBI fugitive, Margarita seemed more than comfortable walking around and being seen. She had a sense of entitlement and power, often giving orders to City Hall employees and demanding service from local pharmacists. Chico's podcast caused a frenzy in Brazil, with fans blocking the street to take pictures in front of Margarita's home, hoping to catch a glimpse of her. Neighbors were divided when her crimes were revealed. Some neighbors reacted strongly, while others had long known of her crimes and did nothing. Rumors eventually spread that Margarita had fled the abandoned home and ran away again. However, Chico confirmed she never left and is just living even more secluded, though he still sees her occasionally. Everything else has returned to how it was before the podcast. So you're probably wondering now, what exactly did she do? Margarita, a trained engineer, and Renee moved to America from Brazil in the late 1970s after marrying. They took their domestic worker, a Brazilian woman known only as Dos Santos, who had previously worked in Margarita's parents' house and was given as a gift to the couple. Yeah, you can already see where this is going to get problematic, right? For years, Dos Santos worked without pay or days off and endured constant aggression and humiliation. Dos Santos lived in a chilly basement with a large hole in the floor covered by plywood. She bathed using a metal tub, hauling water from an upper floor, and slept on a cot with a thin mattress. The refrigerator was also locked to prevent her from accessing it. She also described repeated mistreatment from Margarita and having hot soup thrown in her face. She also lived with a large, non-cancerous tumor that was ignored. Dos Santos was eventually freed in the early 2000s after fleeing Margarita's home during one of the couple's trips out of town. A neighbor reported the situation to the police, leading to an FBI investigation. Rene was sentenced to six and a half years for violating immigration laws and ordered to pay $110,000. Margarita has been living as an FBI fugitive in Brazil ever since and is still wanted by by the authorities. The thing is, Margarita would have already been out of prison and living her life however she wanted to if she hadn't fled. But instead, she locked herself away in a crumbling mansion for at least 20 years, throwing smelly bags out of her windows, and she's still living with the threat of possibly getting arrested and doing some time. So she traded one prison for another. If she ever gets sent to the US, this will have all been for nothing, which is what she deserves. Number two, unjustified. San Antonio police identified Adia Demir Robertson as a suspect in a fatal incident involving Daniel Shrewsbury at a Sonic drive-in. Authorities had requested public assistance in locating Robertson, accused of ending the life of Shrewsbury, a 33-year-old fast food manager. Robertson reportedly argued with Shrewsbury before a firearm was used against him. Shrewsbury then walked back into the restaurant and collapsed, EMS later pronouncing his passing at the scene. The reason behind the argument remains unclear, and it's not known if they they knew each other. The San Antonio Police Department released images of Robertson and another person who were seen together shortly before the incident. They urge Robertson to surrender and request anyone with information on her whereabouts to contact them. Shrewberry's mother, Peggy Cofield, shared her grief on social media, mentioning her son's love for his job. A GoFundMe page was set up to cover his funeral expenses, raising over $4,800. Peggy's post revealed more details about the incident. She explained that there was some dispute over some fake money used to pay for food. And if you've ever worked in food service, you know this sort of thing isn't unusual. But instead of just leaving and trying her luck somewhere else, the suspect chose to use force, resulting in her son's life ending. Daniel, who would have turned 34 shortly after the incident, was described as a beloved individual by many. Peggy expressed her profound loss and confusion, appealing for any financial support, no matter how small, to help with funeral expenses. Possibly the worst thing about this case is that Daniel wasn't even supposed to be there that day. He was actually covering a shift for a co Worker. So he was being a good friend and paid the ultimate price for it. As of the release of this video, Robertson is still at large, despite multiple tips being called in as to her whereabouts. So it's just a matter of time before she's brought in, but we hope it's sooner than later. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned right here to find out the depths she went to to rob her sugar daddy. Number one, the true psychopath. 
Wade Wilson from Florida was convicted of ending the lives of two women and is now facing the ultimate penalty. The decision to pursue this particular punishment was influenced by his complete lack of remorse and the brutal nature of the crimes. Yes, we know he shares the name with Deadpool, but there's really nothing funny about this story or this guy. Wilson, a 30-year-old from Florida, was convicted of ending the lives of Christine Melton and Diane Ruiz back in 2019. The jury recommended the ultimate penalty, citing the heinousness of his actions and the fact that he was smug throughout the trial. Wilson's total lack of remorse was evident before his trial. After committing the crimes, Wilson called his biological father, Stephen Testeseca, several times and told him about his crimes in an eerily emotionless manner. The details were so gruesome and Wilson was so nonchalant that initially Testeseca thought he had to be joking. But once he realized Wilson was serious, he helped the police locate and arrest him. Wilson had met his first victim, Christine Melton, and her friend at a bar and after a night out, the trio went back to her place. When Melton's friend left, Wilson ended her life as she slept. He then stole her car and ran into Diane Ruiz, a hard-working bartender. Wilson lured Ruiz into the car, and when she tried to leave, he ended her life as well. Christine Melton, originally from Illinois, was known for her quick wit and caring nature. She had moved to Cape Coral and was working as a waitress. Diane Ruiz, a dedicated mother, was described as caring and hardworking. She never missed a shift at the Moose Lodge in Cape Coral. During Wilson's trial, the defense argued that Wilson had a diseased mind because of his issues with certain substances. However, the prosecution countered that Wilson was clearly far more driven by power and control and apparently had no problems ending someone's life. The jury recommended the ultimate penalty, and the final decision will be decided by Judge Nicholas Thompson. As of the release of this video, Wilson's sentencing has been delayed. His defense filed a motion for a new trial or acquittal, and the judge will consider this alongside the penalty recommendation. While awaiting sentencing, Wilson has also been linked to a prison gang and was involved in a failed escape attempt. We're very glad it wasn't successful because just looking at this guy, you believe everything he's accused of. What are some of the clearest signs of a scam? Let's find out. Starting with... Number six. Old guy gets scammed by a girl he tried to help. Waitress Anissa Yega scammed $100,000 from an 84-year-old widower. Donald Hodgins met Yega when she worked as a waitress at a restaurant he always went to. Pretty soon, she was cleaning his house as a side hustle. Yega told Hodgins that she had a terminal brain tumor, so he began helping her with money for car payments, student loans, and other bills she couldn't afford. She also asked for $30,000 for surgery on the tumor. Although Hodgins thought he was saving her life, Yega didn't have a tumor. She took the money and had a nice vacation in Miami. What a great person. Like nearly everyone, Yega had a lot of excuses for why she needed money. Like telling Hodgins that she needed $500 for medicine for her sick mother. Hodgins didn't have a lot of family around him, but thankfully an acquaintance reported the situation to local law enforcement. The authorities froze Yega's bank accounts and arrested her. Yega's lawyer argued that Hodgins willingly gave Yega gifts because he was attracted to her and made up the scam allegations when he found out she was in a relationship with another man. Which was probably at least somewhat true, but it's a hard argument to say that Hodgins made up her making up that she had a brain tumor. It sounds like this was a classic case of an older guy wanting to help a pretty young girl who used her looks and charm to scam money from him. Seniors are getting targeted more and more, so it's important to maintain connections with them. It's almost always friends and family that stop these scams from happening. Number five, way too good to be true. An Austin mom, known only as Katie, exposed a MacBook cheating husband scam where scammers offered to give away free laptops for a small shipping fee. Katie responded to a posting in a local buy-sell group on Facebook offering to give away a brand new MacBook. The poster claimed they bought the laptop as a gift for their husband but caught him cheating and wanted to get rid of it. Katie wanted the computer for her daughter and reached out immediately. The scammer told her that they had recently moved away from the Austin area but would still give Katie the laptop for free if she could cover 
cover the cost of shipping. Excited to get a free laptop, Katie agreed and sent $55 to the poster through Venmo. But when she asked for the tracking number, the scammer stopped responding. So Katie started to worry that the offer was too good to be true, but kept messaging the poster to see if the MacBook had shipped anyway. The poster eventually told her that it would be an additional $80 to send it overnight and that she needed to cover insurance since they were unable to send the device without it. Katie luckily realized it was a scam and told the fraudster she was no longer interested. But the scammer urged her to send more money and called her repeatedly on Facebook Messenger. Katie searched MacBook cheating husband on Facebook and found hundreds of identical posts to the ones she saw. She reported the scam to the local group's administrator, reported dozens of other posts to Facebook, and alerted Venmo about the account the scammer was using to collect funds. The scam is clever because it might not seem like a big scam on its own, but it was clearly targeting thousands of people on a daily basis. It's effective because it's not too greedy. And good old Facebook told Katie that the posts didn't violate community standards and refused to take them down. Because, of course, right? So she reached out to CBS Austin to help her raise awareness for the scam. Katie was lucky she lost such a small amount, and her story is a reminder that if it's too good to be true, then it's too good to be true. Number four, The Sting. An 81-year-old grandfather from New Zealand, who didn't wish to be named, lost his life savings after scammers targeted his bank account. It started with a phone call from someone claiming to be a police officer. They told the grandfather that they were working on a sting and wanted to transfer money into his account as part of it. He agreed to help and followed their instructions on who to send the cash to. So the victim actually went inside his bank to transfer $40,000 to an offshore account that he'd never used before. His request should have raised some red flags for the teller processing the transaction. But of course, the bank couldn't be bothered. So he successfully transferred the money and never saw it again. The money was supposed to be for his son and granddaughter and he was determined to recover the money. So the grandfather made a series of impassioned phone calls to multiple banks in an effort to make them review their practices. The bank claimed its staff showed the man materials on how to spot scams and asked him questions to confirm that he was transferring his funds to a secure account. Which is just such nonsense, isn't it? Well, we gave him a pamphlet. Oh, what else do you want? Obviously, the 81-year-old man thinking he's helping the police is to blame. Victim advocates stood up for him and called for financial institutions to implement stricter security measures. Scammers often groom their victims and banks intervening with potential devastating transactions could save people tens of thousands of dollars. The organization, Consumer New Zealand, acknowledged that the country's banking system was behind on security and pointed out that there was an increase in scams. Sadly, the grandfather still hasn't recovered the money he lost. Anytime a government agency asks you to transfer money to help out an investigation, it's a scam. The government has enough of your money already. They don't need more to bust the bad guys. Number three, tech support. A fake tech support guy stole almost $50,000 from a retiree who kept his bank account numbers and passwords in his computer. Shiam Hawk Leong wanted to take a break from his computer to go for a walk with his wife when his computer crashed. But his computer suddenly went blank. A bunch of words started flashing across the screen and a voice came through the speakers telling him someone was trying to hack into his accounts and urged him to call Microsoft. If you're not too comfortable with technology, of course, this would scare the crap out of you. So Leong panic and called the number provided. A man named Sean, who had a heavy Indian accent, answered the call and explained that this was the reason people pay so much for the software. It told them when someone was hacking their computer. Sean said that he was there to help stop this person from stealing Leong's personal information. So Leong followed Sean's instructions, including entering his email, password, and turning off his cell phone so that the scammer would be unable to access it. The call lasted two to three hours. Sean and Leong talked for a while and shared personal details such as Leong's father being injured in the army and his family moving to the United States where they opened a convenience store. While he was on the phone, Leong's wife was cooking in the background. He wanted to hang up so he could eat, so Sean told him to leave his PC on overnight as the problem was too big to be solved over just a few hours. But Leong's gut told him to turn on his cell phone, even though Sean told him to keep it off. When he did, he got a list of notifications from his bank telling him about multiple transactions that had occurred while he was talking to Sean. Someone had siphoned tons of money from his account, so the retiree turned off his computer and contacted the bank. 
He filed a police report and froze his bank accounts. The police discovered that the money was transferred into the accounts of Anil Tripathi, who was arrested. Tripathi, who was a permanent resident in Singapore, said he thought a well-wisher had given him the money and redistributed it among his bank accounts, sending $10,000 to his home country of India. You know how that goes, right? All those anonymous well-wishers just sending you piles of cash constantly? It's a tale as old as time. The prosecution argued that if Tripathi thought someone had given him the money out of generosity, he should have at least verified the source of the transfers. Although prosecutors said there was no evidence connecting Tripathi to the scam, it should have been treated like finding a wallet on the ground and spending the money inside of it. Basically, if he was claiming he just kind of found the money, it still wasn't his money to spend. At the time that the transfers happened, Tripathi only had $50 in his two bank accounts. When prosecutors asked him why the funds entered his accounts, he claimed to have no idea. It's pretty hard to believe that he knew nothing when he immediately spent some of the money instead of reporting it to law enforcement. Tripathi also said he was willing to return the money to Chiam, although he would have to pay restitution on the $10,000 that he sent back to his family. If Tripathi is found guilty of dishonest misappropriation, he faces up to two years in jail and a hefty fine. It seems like if Tripathi wasn't Sean on the phone, he definitely knew who the scammer is and was playing dumb. Whenever you get unexpected emails, texts, or messages claiming something is wrong and to call this number, never call it. If you need to verify your concerns, always get the number yourself. Number two, the classic third person. This story involves a Singaporean retiree who lost her life savings to a fake Facebook friend. A man named Alvin sent a woman, known as Madame Tan, a friend request on Facebook. According to his profile, Alvin was a Singaporean chief executive of an interior design firm in London and was in the process of completing a hotel, which would be his last project before retiring. After the two exchange messages, Alvin asked Tan to help him get his hands on some materials from companies in China. He was referred to a specific company Company, but since he didn't speak Mandarin, he hoped she would act as an intermediary. Madame Tan was skeptical of Alvin until he transferred money into her account for the cost of the materials. He also showed her transfer statements from his British bank account, Barclays, which reassured her that she could trust him. Alvin had her make a list of transfers and sent her transfer statements to confirm the transactions. But the statements were fake. Madame Tan thought it would take a few days for Alvin's deposit into her account to clear. Then he told her she needed to keep making payments for additional fees like she shipping and taxes. So she made 22 transfers of $20,000 each. Tan borrowed money from her son and took out a loan to make the final transaction of 50,000 bucks. Weeks after her first transfer, Madame Tan received a phone call from a Malaysian number that told her that Alvin had been detained at the airport for having too much cash on him. He needed her to pay $98,000 to release him from police custody. Her son was already suspicious of the transaction she was making, and before Madame Tan could approach her daughter for a loan, he intercepted and told her she was being scammed. Madame Tan attempted to confront the scammers, but they cut off all communication with her. She had three numbers for Alvin, two of which didn't answer the phone, and the third was a WhatsApp App account that was no longer linked to the app. Her children helped her file two police reports and write letters to the accounts that she sent the money to. In 15 days, Madame Tan lost $1 million that she likely won't be getting back. Although there are situations where someone needs help making transfers due to every country having different banking systems, the only people who should ever do this would be people you know personally and have known for a long time. You can never be too cautious when it comes to your finances. Number one, the online only friend. An unknown caller convinced an elderly woman known only as Emily to send them $10,000 through the mail. The caller spent weeks earning Emily's trust in what seems like a bit of a romance scam before convincing her to withdraw the money from her bank account and follow some pretty specific instructions. The caller had her go to the bank and withdraw the cash and to explain to the tellers that it was for her family. Then they had her stuff the bills into clothing items, tuck them into a box with random household objects on top and write happy birthday on the side of the box, which isn't suspicious at all. The caller insisted that she say that the gifts were for her family when she dropped it off at the post office. Emily followed the instructions and separated $4,000 into two boxes, one that she sent to New York and the other to New Mexico. The caller pressed Emily for her visa card number as they wanted to withdraw an additional $5,000. Emily's close friend Wanda found out about the situation and rushed to Emily's home. Emily insisted that she needed to go to the bank 
bank to get the money, but Wanda wouldn't let her leave. She saw what was going on. So they called the local sheriff's department, who helped the two women lock Emily's visa card before any money could be withdrawn, and stopped the two packages from reaching their destinations. Emily admitted that she was willing to take out a loan to help out the caller who wanted to travel to meet her. The police told her that if the caller did try to meet her in person, to immediately call 911. They also recommended that she ignore phone calls if she didn't recognize the number. Luckily, Emily got all of her money back thanks to Wanda's help. Sadly, many seniors don't have a Wanda watching their backs and making sure everything is okay. So please, help keep an eye on your elderly loved ones. Family or not, they deserve your protection, especially when it comes to shady financial transactions. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather have right now. One month of a free vacation to any destination you want, everything paid for, or $15,000 cash.